could. Beautiful. All right. I have a few things to say, so I left you with verse 1. Nations, let the earth and all it contains here, and the word that, uh, uh, and all that springs from it, and so on. And in verse 2, basically, for the Lord has an indignation against all the nations. So that's the destruction of all the nations in chapter 34, verses 1 to 4. And we carry on here. I'm going to come back to that slide in a moment. So in verses 2b to 4 here, it describes the result of God's judgment against all the nations. In verses 2b to 4, the second part of verse 2 until 4, it described the judgment against all the nations. Two points to make. Upon the armies, verses 2 and 3, and his wrath against all their armies, he has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. Verse 3, so their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched with blood. So the armies are devoted, circled in your notes, the word devoted, it's the word haram. It's a very severe, it's devoted to destruction, haram. It's devoted to destruction totally. Forget about young people, it's devoted to destruction. And their bodies will give up their stench, and there will be a multitude of blood. Okay, make a note that is not on that slide here. Revelation 14, 19 to 20. I will read it for you. Revelation chapter, 9, chapter 14, verses 19 to 20. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the cluster from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the winepress to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. So Isaiah allude exactly, not Isaiah if you want, let me correct my sentence, John, having written the book of Revelation, alludes exactly back to Isaiah, to these prophecies. Once again, I repeat, your best way to understand the end time is by doing exactly what you do now. Studying the Old Testament to make sense of it all. That completes my point number one. Point number two is quite interesting here, alluding to the scriptures that you have there will be basically convulsions of the heavens also. Since the heavens also were polluted. If I ask you when you might be challenged, when were the heavens polluted? At the fall of Satan. Everything that uh, Satan had access became defiled to an extent. Job 15.15. 15. Job is the most older books of the Bible after Genesis. Job 15.15 15 says this. Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones. That's the angels. And the heavens are not pure in his sight. Since the fall of Satan, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. 
Do you remember when Mary wanted to touch Jesus and he said, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father. He went with his own blood, cleansed what was defiled and came back for the next chapter or the next paragraph. He could not be touched as a high priest because he would have been defiled by her, went, cleansed what he needed with better blood than calves, came back. I hold that view quite solid. It's quoted basically in Revelation also. So now we have dealt with this part of the slide. Now we deal with the place of destruction of all the nation. Verses 5, 6, and 7. Come with me, verses 5, 6, and 7. And I pause right now. I know that it makes sense for you. Your memory is challenged tonight. We did it the reverse. A few years ago, we did Daniel in that class. You came, and you did also Revelation with TSM. We went upside down. It's better to, to go upside down than not to go at all. So we did Revelation, and, mm, 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 and now we do Isaiah, and we learn even more right now. So you will see here your memory being t- t- uh, having a boost right now, because you, will, you know exactly when I'm, what I will be talking about in a moment. Come with me in 5, 6, and 7. seven. For my sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, behold it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. Circle very carefully Edom. And upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. The sword of Jehovah is filled with blood. It is sated with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Circle the whole thing. And a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen will also fall with them, and young bulls with strong ones, and their land will be soaked with blood, and their dust become greasy with fat. The specific nation where the sword of Jehovah will strike The specific nation where the sword of the Lord will strike against the Gentile armies is the nation of Edom. I have personally been there. Edom is southern Jordan today right in front of Elath. Southern. Southern Jordan. For Edom itself, the people itself, they too, the people, will be the, 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 the object of God's curse. Haram. Like this. Devoted to destruction. If you want to read a book about what I say right now, a book of the Bible, you read Obadiah. He talks about Haram. The fact that Edom will be completely devoted to destruction. While, I'm going to go black. While the people of Haman and Moab will have a remnant that will survive there, not so with Edom. No surviving remnant from the kingdom of Edom. None or whatsoever. In verse 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is sated with fat, with the blood of rams, and so on. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. The slaughter of the nations here 
is viewed as a massive sacrifice. Not only the place. It's viewed as a massive sacrifice. Don't note that. You have already done that. Jeremiah 46.10. You have just noted this slide. I'm just reading the text for you. Jeremiah 46.10. For that day belongs to the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, so as to avenge himself of his foes. Do you see how it makes sense? And the sword will devour and be satiated and drink its fill of their blood. And there will be a slaughter for Jehovah of us in the land of the north by the river Euphrates. That's the same place. Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel chapter 39 verses 17 to 20 reads as follow. As for you, son of man, thus says Jehovah God, speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field, assemble and come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I am going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goat, bulls, all of them fatling of Bashan. Okay? Same situation. Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Verse chapter 1 of Zephaniah. Verses 7 and 8. 7 and 8. Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. That's the great tribulation. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guest. His guest is the Gentile nation. Then it will come about on that day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's son, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. That's the sacrifice of Bosra. Revelation 19, Revelation 19, 17 and 18. Revelation 19, 17 and 18. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you read this one. Okay? So while Edom has been chosen, he narrows it down to a city right now. And that city is Basra, or Petra. Because that's where the remnant is hiding. Those who will ask him to come back, they're gathered there. Miraculous provision. Remember this here. Heights. Munitions of rock, bread of water. So that's where the people of Israel, the remnant, is gathered in that place. Provi in yes, provided miraculously. And all the armies of the Antichrist of nation will gather there to destroy them. And they will be destroyed by the second coming of the Messiah. Okay? Remember the purpose of Armageddon? What's the purpose of gathering all the armies in Basra to destroy the Jews? That's the purpose. To completely get rid of them. Once and for all. And it will not work. Okay. Make a note of Matthew chapter 24, verse 28. Because the life of Christ is far behind us, although it's done now, it's being taught right now at the very beginning. Matthew chapter 24, verse 28 says this. Wherever the corpse is, there the vulture will gather. 
wherever the people of Israel are, there the vulture, the Gentiles' army, will gather them together to annihilate them here. That's where the nations and armies are destroyed. Jeremiah 49, 13 and 14. And in verse 7, that's the great sacrifice. Wild oxen will also fall with them, young bulls with strong ones. Their land will be soaked with blood and their dust become greasy fat here. And instead of calling this the, the, the campaign of Armageddon, it has a better title for this, a more scripture, a scriptural title. Uh, title for that battle it's this revelation 16 14 this is the war of the great day of god the almighty what is the war of the great day of god the almighty that's harmageddon the mountains of megiddo the mountains of megiddo Now, what I would like to do, I would like you to have this in mind, what I just read, 5, 6, and 7. Here, I would like you to have this in mind, and I need to jump the gun right now. So, come with me in Isaiah 63. This I don't read for you, you come with me in Isaiah chapter 63. Go to Isaiah 63. In Isaiah 63, Isaiah gives us a graphic picture of this. I'm just going to make a few comments here right now. When he comes back for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty, this is the second return of Christ. You know that. You and I come back with him. With the angels also. We know that from Jude. That's where you will be in the kingdom. You're coming back with him. But look at where we, what we will doing when we come back with him and we won't do anything significant at that place. Come with me. 63. Verse 1. My header says God's vengeance on the nation. So here Isaiah spoke exactly what he spoke in chapter 34. Come. Who is this who comes from Edom? With garments of glowing colors from Basra. This one, Kemet capital O, who is majestic, majestic in his apparel, Marching in the greatness of his strength, it is I, circle I, who speak in righteousness, you circle mighty to save. Who is mighty to save? Which person of the Trinity has the name means Savior? Jesus. Jesus. Here is the second person of the triune God. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing color from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, that's the Shekinah, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the wine press? I have trodden the wine trough alone. So he will fight against the nation and you will not be helping, only witnessing and from the peoples there there was no man with me i also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments and i stained all my raiment for the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption has come i looked and there was no one to help. 
and I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. He comes back. He is the agent of creation. He was capable of creating this world in six days. And he comes back and he will fight by himself. In his glorified state, he is justice. He will do it. So who is this from Edom, from Basra? And people joke at this that he was not from Bethlehem. He's from Basra. <laughs> Who is this that comes from Edom? So Jesus is not from Bethlehem, he's from Edom. Of course, it's, it's a joke, okay? So from Edom, he places there, the second question, his garments, stain, battle of the war of the great day of the Lord, and this will affect the land of Edom permanently. Make note this. This will affect the land of Edom permanently. Go back to 34, please. Isaiah 34. This will affect the land of Edom permanently. Go back to 34. And now look at your outlines. Number three. We dealt with number two. The place of destructions of all the nations. Simply put, Basra. The cause, 34.8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Circle vengeance, circle recompense. In Hebrew, these two words are plural. In Hebrew, these two expressions, a day of vengeance and recompense, the Hebrew words are plural, simply to emphasize the intensity. It does emphasize the in intensity. It is at that place in Basra, at the second return when the Gentiles' army gather there, that all sins against Israel will now be revenged. All kinds of anti-Semitism of this planet will be punished at that place. And that's why Edom, not these guys, Ammon and Moab, that's why Edom will be forever a wasted place. When you imagine that in your mind, that this is all kinds of anti-Semitism from all the nations, including this country here, will be punished at that place, it's quite normal that they will not remain on the planet. That the Jews are hiding. No, but the good ones. But I'm talking about the bad ones. Oh, the bad ones are gone, yeah. They, they, they don't battle against their own people, though they're, they're simply in the state of unbelief. The armies gathered, it's with the Antichrist to destroy their, the Jews. We're not talking about unbelieving Jews per se. They don't have an army against their own people. Where are, are they at that moment? Dead in the Great Tribulation dead in the great tribulation okay. okay those who accept the mark point of no return then in the great trip oh, okay. okay because keep in mind the national regeneration of the people of israel it's done in the last three days and basically do you remember that the antichrist will destroy two-thirds yeah. of the jewish population yeah. okay the question was valid we just need to cut and paste piece of information but now you you know you just say oh yeah that's true Okay, because the Jewish people will be quite affected in the Great Tribulation. You know that. I always use the same analogy, not the same analogy, it's not an analogy, it's a fact that Hitler in the uh, Nazi Holocaust got rid of one third of the Jewish population. 
is a type of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will manage to destroy two-thirds of the Jewish population that will be existing in those days. And the remnant now are hiding in Basra. And if the Lord is not coming back, all of them will be executed. But you know that he's coming back and save them. And who's living in Edom? The Edomites. It's an Arab state. The Edomites, yeah. Okay. Now the results on Edom. A few questions will be answered right there from 9 to 15. I won't have time to, to take it all, but I'm going, just going to give you this here, 9 to 15. Is it subdivided? No, it's not. So it's a longer passage. Come with me. I will explain a few things. Its streams will be turned into pitch, circle pitch, and its loose earth into brimstone. And its land will become burning pitch, circle burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day, and its smoke will go up forever, circle forever. From generation to generation, it will be desolate, circle desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. But the pelican, the hedgehog, will possess it. And all and raven will dwell in it, and he will stretch over it the line of desolation, circle desolation, the plumb line of emptiness, circle emptiness. I will st stop right there. As we saw in Daniel and in the book of Revelation, Babylon will become an abode for demons. It was the initial place of witchcraft, and Babylon will become an abode, a residence for demons. And the same fate, F-A-T-E, is awaiting for Edom. The same fate will become for Edom also in Babylon. That's what we call the two desolate spots on earth for the thousand year. These two places will be a place of perpetual devastation as a witness against sin. These two places will become in a permanent state of devastation, perpetual devastation. And here in verses 9 and 10, when I, you have the word forever in verse 10, it's forever, it's for an age, it's for a duration of 1,000 years until the end of the age, the messianic age. So sometimes the word forever is not always forever. Here, it's for until the end of an age. What age? The messianic age. So this will last for 1,000 years. It will not be transferred into the eternal state. Pardon me? So it's not permanent. Not permanent, but it says forever, but you need to divide by dispensation there. For 1,000 years, nothing but a burning wasteland, burning pitch. No animal can survive these conditions. And certainly no human habitants there. But it will have some habitants in there, some residents. My translation is the pelican, hedgehog, owl, raven, and so on. They are not real animals. They are demons. Because keep in mind that angels, even fallen angels, have animalistic feature. The cherubim, the seraphim, and the common angels, they have animalistic feature. 
It's good for the good angels and the bad angels. No real animal can be fed in these places. Same for Babylon. In Babylon will be the same waste place and there will be a quantity of demons in goat form, which I will re, uh, come back in a moment of time. But what I want you to notice right now as we finish the class 49 is the verse 11, Hebrew words. So let, let me read 11 again. But the pelican and the hedgehog will possess it, all and raven will dwell in it. And he will stretch over it the line of desolation or some... Tra what do you have, Germain, for desolation? Do you have the word confusion? Yeah. Oh, really? Like it? And the plumb line of emptiness. Look at the slides. The Hebrew words such as desolation, comma, confusion in some translation, and emptiness are the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 when the earth became void, and so on. I ask Olga to read Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. So, formless, void, and the surface of the deep are desolation, confusion, and emptiness. The earth in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 became like this because of the fall of Satan. It's a judgment. And so for Edom, using the same words here, emphasizes the judgment on that place. In both places, these are words of judgment. It became desolation, confusion, and emptiness. Good for two places. During the Messianic Kingdom, it's going to be valid for two places, Babylon and Edom. Verse 12. It's nobles. There is no one there whom they may proclaim king and its princes will be nothing. The disappearance of any kings and nobles. In Edom right now, when the king dies, is the kingdom of the Ashamite right now, they elect a new king, they appoint a new king. It will not be the same. In Roman Catholicism, when the Pope dies, the cardinals get together, they elect a new one. It's just an example. There will be no more living people at that place. Completely annihilated. No more of this for Edom. No more of this for Edom. I think it is sufficient for tonight. So I will stop right at that place and continue with the rest of it next week. So verse 12, I stop right there. Make a note for yourself. Verse 12, now I need to 13, 14, and so on and so forth to continue on the same thought. Okay, so what have we covered tonight before we pray together as finishing here? The state of the people in the time of the restoration, a place of peace and tranquility, you know, habitation being secure. The state of the nation at the time of the restoration, Jerusalem flowing with waters, not flood, but living water emanating from the temple the waters of life, and so on. The state of the government. Government is the Messiah, the justice, and so on and so forth. Capital E, Jehovah's indignation against all the nations. It's all the anti-Semitic nations into which we are right now. We will go to the one world government, and then we will go to the ten kings, and then the Antichrist. That's where we are on time right now. And we don't have righteousness within our governments today. And we have lots of anti-Semitism happening. All of it 
the nations will be punished for this. And that includes North America. We will not escape that. You will, because you will not be there. But those left at that time will not escape this. So we have a mandate to encourage our younger generation of all kinds of churches not to turn anti-Semitic. To have a place for the Jews in their soul and their support also. Did you know that no church on Vancouver Island North in North America, no one local church, Church supports the Sword Ministry Society. None. Individual from, yes. But no local church has a piece of the pie, 20 bucks a month or so on. None. Beautiful. I receive no money from a local congregation because it's a Jewish slanted ministry. Even the faith. Our Christianity is slowly turning anti-Semitic. Just by allegorizing the Messianic kingdom, these are anti-Semitic teachings. Make a deep examination outside of the portfolio of your own local congregation. You're not blessed because you missed the mark. You think you're blessed, but you're not. God bless you. Thank you.